Journal notes from seven years of living art and experience of the seven chakras by Linda Mary Montano. Year one, red. 1984 to 1985, December 8. December, the big opening. I go to the new museum in red, see the Jamaican guard before I go into the window. He sings religious songs with an accordion. He sees me off. I hug a woman working there and say my last English, no accented words to her. They are goodbye. I feel very sentimental and nostalgic. The last unaffected speech for seven years. Openings are over. The piece begins. It feels right, rhythmical, strong, good for me, consistent. It gives me something to do. It directs me. It's an insurance policy. I am making art and in the state of art 24 hours a day. I get to focus with and around it. I am amazed at my ability to structure such a thing, but it was not without mentors and influences. Now I have a dependable order, which is ob obviously my style. It contains my signature and overtones. It seems as if it has four elements, sound, color, accent, palm rating, but not the physical dangers of the last piece with Taishin. Yes, there is danger in the accent because I have to use it with everyone but my immediate family, but the danger is that I might not get jobs or will affect relationships with it. This was the hardest decision to make. I imagined having to go to the hospital and see my mother sick with cancer and have to talk to her doctors in a French accent, and it just seemed impossible. So when I finally talked it over with my family, my mother, an artist actually suggested the concept of doing it with everyone but them, that is, talk in an accent with everyone but my immediate family. The purpose is getting clearer. It is to question my way of doing things and to find new structures outside of institutional forms so that I can learn to pay attention in my own style. I wonder what the effects of B, the note, will be on me. I need a psychiatrist to study me because I feel somewhat like an organism under an experimental frame, looking for the result of self-chosen tests that I'm doing with myself. I only have subjective ways of measuring the results. Maybe there is another way, like brain waves or growth in areas that could be measured in my brain. I like being validated by different disciplines. The red room is exquisite. The floor is red, the ceiling is red. It took three weeks and three coats to paint it because the second gallon, although it was the same number, was the wrong color. So I had to do it all over again. The room vibrates and first it was physically sick. I was physically sick and dizzy from it but now I love the look and feel of light in the red room. I should have gone into a monastery and forgotten all about this. I can't do it alone. Being out here in art is just too much exposure. I have set myself up as a spiritual guru type and now I'm feeling inadequate. Can I continue? Do it. It is all disturbing. I'm trying to do my work, but I am pulling in criticism, jealousy, competition, bad feelings, something is wrong. I seem to meander, wander, move all over the place. I can get a job here or go there. The piece is designed that way for mobility, do whatever I want and call it art. My accent comes and goes. I am in and out of the red room. It can get sloppy if I don't watch out. The oscillator plays for seven hours, and when I travel, I carry a handheld one with me. Went to the Zen Center and did a session. I listened to the tone at night and listened to the drone of the radiators during the day, which were pitched to be, I think, as a substitute for my machine. But I keep guilting myself and saying that I am making it too easy 
and not sticking to the parameters of the piece. I had some pretty difficult thoughts during Zen session. The piece is designed to produce guilt because one, I am not always able to keep my commitment to the letter of the law. Two, I do not want to keep my commitments. Three, it isolates me. But guilt is obviously what I am working on. That's my theme and personal poison. So I've set it up unconsciously to choose to do something where I have to monitor myself and see that I am keeping my commitments and learning how not to feel guilty when I don't and substitute the thought that attention and mind training are, are what I am after now, not guilt. And if I pay attention to the fact that I only listen to the tone six hours a day, then I don't have to beat myself, but just be aware and attentive. What a great switch from hellfire of Catholicism to mind chemistry. I finally joined the 20th century. Taishin challenges me and talks about public art and says that my work is too private, subtle, and hidden. I still think that there is a male-female polarity here and that we must or at least are drawn to inside places as women. The private work and disciplines that I do prepare me for the window. January exuberant in love new energy what is it why what is it about does the piece work a man drove by in a car the other day and called out i won't hit you i can see you you're all in red i am embarrassed to be in red especially when others see me as a follower of a sect i feel they look at me and judge me I feel theories of some of the gurus are correct, that one way of harmonizing a life issue is by overdoing it. I am overdoing sex. Followers of some gurus do a lot of sex in order to balance that issue in their lives. But somehow I don't want to be seen as part of a group. I'll be glad to graduate to all blue clothes. I feel as if this piece is exciting the first chakra, a place in my body that has been ignored, repressed, made to feel guilty. Actually, this concentration is building a foundation, a strong house, a deep support at the tip of the coccyx. I spend a lot of time there and the heat is on. There are times when my entire body vibrates the note B, which comes out of the exquisite speakers. There are times when I get surges of energy from the red that I am wearing. There are times when I feel a depth in my voice because I'm trying to speak consciously, poetically. It's then that I know that the recipe is working for me. I'm not as disciplined with a French accent as I should be. With some people I am, especially those who speak it with me. With others, I just turn up words at the end, and yet all the time that I am talking, I am inside my head observing, like a stranger in a foreign country feeling alien, and saying to myself, pay attention, you are talking in a French accent, or I say, Linda, you are not talking in a French accent. Pay attention to the fact that you are not doing it. I have no witnesses to see if I am doing this. It is not public. No ropes are tying me. I am my own audience. No lawyers here. Molly said the most interesting thing to me the other day. I said that I was lonely. She said, how can you be lonely when you have the first chakra for company? This could be one of the best days of the peace. I started going to church, but as I came near the door, I realized that the colors were barring me. The people saw red and didn't want me in their upstate New York church. 
So I took my dog Betty and we went for a two mile hike to the water. I felt euphoric, alive, glad. Maybe it's because I'm eating better or the peace is working. The peace has some magic that I wished for and I had with Titian. The magic of paying attention. Friends are not coming around. I'm glad because I would have to talk affected English with them. Intensity. I have been feeling energy lately, but it depletes me. I had better be careful. I felt last night that if I didn't get up, get out of bed immediately and take a shower, that I would jump out of my skin and I would die. I would get so overstimulated, so sick, so upset that I would fall apart. I got up, showered, got beads that Dr. Misher gave me, held on to the beads and fell asleep. I am beginning to worry about the consequences of the intensity. Maybe it is too much for me. Maybe I can't do it. Maybe I will go crazy. That's what I think today. Is this isolation healthy? New cycle birthday. The peace was getting intense around my period, so I took three showers a day and generally had to calm myself. Maybe it's just because I live alone for the first time in 14 years and now feeling less strung out. The sex chakra is eliciting sex. I am drawing people, but more important, I'm feeling it myself. I want it, they want it, it's inevitable. That's what this chakra is about. It feels dangerous. I need protection and hope that I won't be pushed in the wrong way. My first priority is attention, meditation, and clearing out old patterns that have to do with the center that I am working with. So it is only right that I get this chance to work with sex. I am in a stage where I believe in the efficacy of the peace. Am I willing to pay the price to maintain my priority? Am I strong enough? The focus is producing a kind of rapture. I can't keep it hidden. I am becoming the document. I went to a woman's tarot meeting Friday, the first time in public since December 15 had to speak up and present myself in a large gathering. It was difficult. I was upset and self-conscious and felt sick after. For two months, I have been sheltered. The sound is enough of an irritant to keep me alert. Brooklyn, I am traveling with a piece for the first time, trying to adjust to other environments. I like it better in my red room, doing it at home. It is not as easy to do it here. I do not have as much focus or as much incentive. February, the piece is portable. I string my red cloth up like a tent over my bed. It makes a shelter and room duplicating the upstate red room. I feel confident that I can travel and bring the disciplines with me. The sound especially travels well. I wear earphones in the city and walk jubilantly down the street listening to the note B, watching trucks drown it out and listening to it return, wondering what everyone else is listening to. The upstate version is more internal. I can meditate better there. Here it's upbeat, cocaine-like. The city moves. Women seem attracted to the peace. They come in droves, find me in the new museum window. A woman called for an interview, asked how I saw the images. Was I aware of the political aesthetic implications of the window, which was appealing just to artists and not to the pedestrians on the street? I told her that I was speaking to artists because it was important to demonstrate that we can do anything we want and call it art. Traveled with it to LA and San Diego. 
I was able to plug in the tuner each day and listen to the note B. I allowed slides of the piece at UCSD and after wanted to have J.C. Francois listen to the tone, when I turned it on, the battery was dead. My clothes get dirty and there are just so many red things in my repertoire. I have broken the dress cold yet. I have not broken it and always wear red even if I am cold and there is a black jacket available or if my red socks are dirty. My underwear is red. I do wear shades of red or sometimes I have maroon or wine colored pants on with a bright Chinese red shirt. The accent has internalized itself, has become something that I do inside. I can hardly hear it. I lilt every word and don't make a big effort to dramatize it. It's a subtle slurring that gets to be heard as a speech defect at times. Although some people have wondered if I am from Canada, I'm very glad that I have included this handicap in the piece. Reactions to my presentation of seven years at UCSD were mixed. PL loved the song. MR thought that I showed too many slides. AK felt that the palm readings were enough. Each year I will incorporate a theme song into the work. And this year it is my funny Valentine, which I sang as any French chanteur would slowly with tears in my heart. Is this piece allowing me to internalize the teacher, to become my own guru? Am I strong enough? My desire is to go to the Tibet Center and get their blessings. What is my work? How do I update myself? How can I update the piece? How can I financially afford this? AK says that the work of the artist is to stay in the present moment and that the best thing that we can do for art is not to make it. The intention of the sound device is to keep me orally fixed. If it's true that every second there are seven chances to be pulled in seven different directions by the senses of sound, taste, touch, memory, sight, then by introducing a pitch into the environment, I'm giving myself a chance to stay centered. The sound is an irritant because not pleasant. In fact, someone told me that the sound B is the sound of electricity, so that I am always listening to a refrigerator-like sound or overhead fluorescent-like sounds. So the sound pulls me out of the other six options that the mind has in store for me and makes me stay aware. Doesn't a child do that for a mother? I now have a place to go, a sonic home. A Japanese friend calls it commitment art, good word, perfect description. That's exactly what I am doing and it feels right. I like this kind of structure and the subsequent attention that the commitment will bring. I taught a chakra workshop on the first chakra, showed slides, led them through a visualization, and then they did their thing. But they needed more physical preparation because an overactive saxophone player and piano player disturbed the scene with an insistent drive. How could I have drawn that to me? Is it just a reflection of where I am? How responsible am I for what happens around me? Difficulties, one, hard to keep red clothes circulating. Two, hard to keep the small tuner charged up enough to play for seven hours. Three, electric bill is high because the oscillator is on all day. It's almost three months old, this performance. I am beginning to hear the note B at night before I go to sleep. I do not sleep well. I get up and look in the front room to see if the tuner is on. Psychic dangers, they feel real. 
I'm scared by the intensity of the work. I am overexcited and hungry for sex. The concentration is working, but it feels very dangerous. How can I not be so vulnerable? Should I eat better? It is wearing me thin. It is a private ordeal and frightening to me right now. March, the new museum window, still some heavy voices in my head. I ask, am I a quack, a charlatan, a do-gooder with no real expertise? Am I leading people astray by setting myself up as a palm reader? Help. Reading palms has led to a re-examination of my methods and a resolve to do it differently. New thoughts. One, I will do a deeper study of palmistry. Two, more discussion with others who do similar work. Three, use more humor so that it is not so heavy. Brought the piece to San Francisco where I was teaching at the Art Institute for a month. I put up my red tent in the visiting artist's room. It goes well. One of my students from Japan came dressed in green to class to compliment me. So beautiful. Another tape, fluorescent tape on her chakras, took her clothes off and played digital delayed flute in a darkened room while moving her spinal column like a snake. I cried. An art student in my class tattooed the seven chakras on my spinal column. It took about six hours. He shaved two spots on my head for the two discs, the size of a quarter for the sixth and seventh chakra. The procedure was rigorous. There are about five needles in his tool, which jackhammered on my back. I was totally emotionally havoc for the next two days. But after that, it was exciting. Someone told me that a sailor was cured of epilepsy from his tattoo. I am now marked from the back forever and feel energy entering the chakras from these marked sites. Window. I intended the palm reading to be more conceptual and less real. I felt that I was using ideas of availability and redefinition of art, but what has really happened is that people want their palms read, fortunes told, and even more intensely want me to guide them in their lives. I am stretched by my work. The small oscillator has become a pacemaker, keeping me tuned in, keeping me going. It is an art mantra maker. It creates sounds that remind me that I am alive. It is a heartbeat, an irritating reminder of mortality. May, LA airport. I arrive at 2 a.m. and hunt for a place to sleep. Came midnight flight from San Francisco. I ask a porter where there's a safe place and he directs me to the main center. I take a bus there and schlep my heavy bag through the empty waiting room where there is a large black circular couch <clears throat> which is two-sided and holds makeshift beds, sleeping refugees like me who are camping, eating, some with homemade houses, some with feet up, some army men with hats over their faces, shoes off, I pull up, take out my red cloth and construct my own variation of my red home. That next night, PM leaves me at the same place after I finish his class and I stay another night sleeping in the open, preparing for being a bag lady if I ever have to, wearing a red portable room over my head. Is the accent disappearing six months into it? So hard to keep it going, a mistake I feel. Tara said, why are you doing an accent? Stop it. 
I feel restricted by it and upset by my choice. How will I go on this way for seven years? The accent feels like baby talk. I gurgle and say small things, act babyish and young and don't speak right. I can't wait until next year when I will be talking in a non-accent and take on the persona of Teresa of Avila. At least that will be total, internal, without external expectations. I haven't had a sensible conversation in six months. Battery is gone on the small tuner. It was supposed to be able to be recharged for 3,000 hours. Lasted six months. June, battery recharge dotations. Does that mean that New York City's electric current is more powerful? New museum window, 50 children or more are there. A class from Brooklyn that has work up at the museum. They are fascinated and respectful. So few places that children can trust anymore. Always fear of misuse. Milk cartons remind daily of violence in the environment. With each one, I feel the burden of giving the right clues and messages. Not a negative burden, more like a big responsibility, like a surgeon might have when performing a delicate operation. Psychic work is dangerous, and I am aware of that. All races there, 22 cultures. A small Indian boy comes in. <clears throat> I hold both of his hands, say something that I would never remember. <clears throat> After I've said it, in the most cases, he and I go into a lovely trance or something like that. I look and say goodbye. Was he waiting to be dismissed? Or was it really as deep as it felt? This stuff is pretty powerful. <clears throat> a Russian woman pops into the window. She carries the KGB and paranoia around her. Who wouldn't being Russian in America in 1985? Tough position. Two sons are with her and a young looking husband walks around outside peering in occasionally. Sons are there to translate. She falls into the chair, exhausted by excess weight and misunderstood presence in a foreign country. I read her palm. She's in intellectually and emotionally clear. Lifeline shows less fours. I communicate via her son. She puffs in a foreign accent, which gives me space to practice my question. What about life, I ask? Then she says, I am sick, headaches and palsy. I ask if she has done all of the millions of alternative treatments that she could find like acupuncture, vitamins, herbs, as she tried it all, she said, yeah, yeah. She has a lot to live for. Husband, nice sons, all concerned. Is she tired of being a Russian woman in America? Too many aerobic images on TV that don't fit her body. I say, does it make sense to empty your mind and make peace with the people in your life? She says, yeah but some of them are dead. Her eyes are lighting up with recognition of a solution. She is responding. I say, make peace even if they are dead or alive. Make peace with everyone. <clears throat> if you want life, you can have it. <clears throat> Having seen that in her hand, 
That's all that she wanted to hear. She and I look and understand union. She pops to stand and like a ship at sea, sails slowly out of the room with her male guides, her sons, ready to begin again. Window. A 50-year-old woman comes in, a handwriting an analyst, appreciative, enjoys the process with me. How do you do that, she asks, and says, I do handwriting analysis the same way that you are doing it. I know what I do is intuitive. I still am fascinated by what you are doing because it is so mysterious. We connect, she receives, I receive. We are in the same business and talking shop by trusting each other. After the reading, she gets up and somehow either I followed her or she forgot to turn around. She backs out of the room and tumbles, judo, judo style down two big steps onto the rug below, hopping up and walking off just like a martial artist. I'm too altered by the day to feel guilty and let her go without making a big scene since she appeared well and walked. And for the first time in my life, I have given myself instantaneous forgiveness. I found out yesterday morning that Taishin and I will not be able to see each other for a year, beginning July 1st. He is doing a piece which involves not reading, not seeing, not talking art, not seeing art, not visiting art places for a year. And therefore, since I am an art event, so to speak, we cannot be together. It's encouraging and somewhat devastating. Encouraging because I am honored as art. That is, I am a work of art, a living sculpture, a walking chakra. I really am doing something. This piece makes it obvious, but the devastation is that I will not see him for a year, and that feels terrible. I have grown used to our alliance, and now after two and one half years, it is severed and not the same. He responded by saying that I could stay in his place and he would go to see George and stay there or hide when I came in so that I could use the room in the basement. I cried with the proof of his concern. So we work together again, this time by not being tied by a rope for a year. This time we are separate, separated, apart. This time we have no contact, like two twins living in two different parts of the country. The gift is received and untouched. The lowest first chakra has begun to twirl move in a fast circular pattern like the tail of a firecracker. It's obvious that this kind of concentration on sexuality, it's bringing up early memories, new yearnings, pubescent fantasies, which I cur curtailed in my Catholic youth. <clears throat> I could become silly I'm drawn to psychology books and Freudian edible theories. I must see, since I live 20 minutes from him, how I related to my father and how subsequent partners were extensions of my family. Now am I in the process of divorcing the family so I can move on. My body is slowly becoming a site for pleasure. Finally, my birthright. Red <clears throat> attracts. It is vitality, lust, passion, foundations, roots. It is the color used by bullfighters. I'm seen and noticed because of it. 
It is an obvious uniform, red socks even. Third world people respond positively to me. They understand red and we smile. Walking down the street the other day, a man said, red, that's my color. I visited Muriel Oakley-Rees the other day. After her children, she declared herself a maintenance worker and subsequently worked with the sanitation department as art. We understand each other's pragmatic need to make life art, that is, wanting to create chosen rituals and disciplines which set limits and teach concentration, commitment, and appreciation for being alive. Other people do it in their own way. Artists choose strange metaphors, actions, or symbols to speak what is essentially the same language. The first chakra activates the sense of smell. It's my favorite anyway, and spring is overwhelmingly exotic and intense. Honeysuckle, mint. Upstate New York is like a night in the gardens of Spain. It's easier to wear winter red clothes than summer ones. I continue to work for my 75-year-old aunt three or four times a week. She's dying of cancer, a nine-inch long growth in her esophagus. Laser treatment opens it a little further every two weeks. Then it closes again. I always liked her. She was exotic and looked and talked like Peggy Lee. We speak normally, no accent, because she is in the immediate family. She is very lucid. Here ends the first chakra journal entries, 1985 to 1986, year two, seven years of living art. Orange, note C, top of pelvic bone, quality, security. The change. I made the change from red to orange December 8, 1985, here in Kingston at 85 Abeel Street, across the street from where I did red. For the change, I came backwards into the room with a mask of my face on the back of my head and my jumpsuit open so that you could see the chakras on my back. I stood there while a song by Linda Ronstadt, Siempre Separados, was playing, alluding to the relationship with the impossible, illicit lover whose presence in my life had caused major, major issues. Most of red and into April of orange, I was taking care of my aunt who was dying of cancer. It was intense, involving, and exhausting emotionally. I see now that I should have taken a break in November before leaving Red, but I didn't. In general, it was quite consoling to leave the passion and sexual hunger of Red for Orange, which was a water chakra, but more importantly, a companion for Red. I was able to come out of some of the one-pointed desire and start getting a little more realistic. What could be more realistic than real estate? That's what I focused on, having found a building a block and a half away on a Beale Street belonging to Mary DiGiorgio, an 80-year-old woman who became my friend. She was Syrian, a healer, drummer, Jehovah Witness, and one of the most hospitable people that I've ever known. We traded healing techniques, played music together, became good friends. I talked with her and she died, but then she died January 9, 
just after I turned to yellow. Orange is Teresa of Avila, the lusty Spanish mystic who reformed the Carmelites and performed incredible unearthly ex ecstasies and earthy transformations of properties and people. She was a friend to many male confessors and I felt a similar pull towards men friends this year, men whom I wanted to be friends and not lovers with. Teresa spoke and acted through me through intention, although I don't feel that it was a one-to-one -one transfer or merge. Just a guidance and an excuse for me to get out of my own way by believing that another was working through me. And since I insist on asking who am I, then letting myself be someone else, it was a quite a good technique for that spiritual practice. But I must admit that I was following in her footsteps and saw the building as something that she would do, not something that I would pursue on my own. I spent a few months of the second year thinking that the second chakra was two fingers below the navel and that I had tattooed the second one in the wrong place and would have to either put an X through that one or color it orange and then add another one another tattoo at the base of the sternum on the back and call that the third chakra. But that preoccupation was a time waster because eventually I saw that the chakra was perfect and Dr. Mishra was the one that had it exactly like I did and that his second chakra on his chart was where the pubic bone ends Maybe it was my way of not wanting to concentrate there because it is the chakra that opens all of the material from the unconscious and it has the half crocodile, half fish as the animal guide. And it did open big things, feelings, rages, hatreds, shouts, guilts that I had help dealing with from bioenergetic therapy, screams, yells, shouts. And for the first time in my life, I was allowing myself to be with the ugliness in a constructive way, actually. It was the first time that I was letting it come up and oftentimes out. My Aunt Eleanor lived and died halfway through the second chakra. I performed my first chakra, sex and death and security with her and thought that I had cancer too, like her, and actually created a lump on my uterus and breast that year, realizing that when you work on the chakras, you activate many things and symptoms, both physical and mental, as you clean out the body-mind debris, conditioning, and belief systems. So Eleanor was a good guide for me also, someone who had worked all of her life, physical security, head of house, financial security, dying of cancer, lack of security. I worked there three nights a week and that gave me enough money to pay all my bills and have someone who was teaching me how to leave the world. The Winter of Orange, the new museum had a show called Choices, which included Taishin and I and many others. I went into New York City every Sunday after getting off of work and being up all night with my aunt. It was very intense, down and up with her, then off to 8 a.m. driving to New York City, sometimes in snowstorms and doing palm reading from noon to 6 p.m. And it became more demanding because the word got around that I was there, and so a clientele and group began forming, young men contemplating suicide, a schizophrenic who came every Sunday, an old man who loitered outside the window on the street, and who I thought would kill me. Fights broke out in the line of 15 people waiting each Sunday, wanting to be first. I saw about 40 people each Sunday, and they devised all kinds of ways to handle the crowds from sign-up sheets to timers to picking numbers. All of it was uncomfortable because it was becoming big business. 
People were wanting to form friendships, stay long with me in the window. I didn't know how to say goodbye or how to take it so that everyone got an even chance. One woman came in, brought a piece that she made, and then asked me to play it with her. Some wanted serious therapy. Many times I felt as if I was saving lives. When the two months of coming every Sunday was over, I was relieved and things quieted down some. But many times I felt that I had taken on a project too big for me, that I was not a counselor, only an artist, and that the piece was inappropriate. I began pouring a grain of salt in everyone's palm before reading them and said, take this with a grain of salt. And that took the burden off of me. So I was there the second day of the month when the museum was open and they were very responsive about painting the room orange, keeping it a downstate installation and a microcosm of my upstate orange room. Orange was hot and more fun than red. Red's passion almost killed me, literally. I turned on a place and energy that I could hardly handle. And so I turned to the opposite death and worked with my dying aunt to balance all of the sexual energy that was getting released. Orange was hot and two Latin women came into my life that year, Sylvia and Alexandra. Sylvia was one of the people who lived with me as part of the piece. Frank was the other person and Sylvia was cha-cha-cha, hot, wild, hippie, sang Brazilian songs and, and got me to do so. Both she and Alexandra loosened up my voice. So I like now singing with Cassio and add voice, a good thing. Sylvia and Frank collaborated. That is, we lived in tents together, doing chakra opening exercises, singing, exercising, riding bikes, visiting the cave in Kingston, swimming. Frank introduced humor and wildness, Sylvia, lust and wildness, Alexandra shared heart and song. So the clause in my seven year contract that I live with someone for 16 days is very effective and seems to be working. In July, my mother had a colostomy operation and I spent most of the summer with her seeing her through that and helping her adjust. By August, I had dropped the accent almost altogether. And in fact, I was hardly even thinking about it. It had become an attitude, not actuality. It went from doing it to thinking it to not doing it or thinking it, but letting the accent be an attitude that I did or didn't allude to. It became a performance vehicle, but only when I was doing performance formally. Every day was just too much. And it was then that I realized that I was not a saint, but that I was setting up rules that I could break. And in breaking them, I could be like God and forgive myself. What a strange piece I had devised to help me come into my power out of victimization by Catholicism. So saints are good and do everything right. I was doing everything wrong, but I didn't have to feel bad because the rules were somewhat arbitrary and the experiment was just that, an experiment. And what it was teaching me was that the piece was about forgiveness and that my inability to keep my commitments was a psychological ploy that I had unconsciously set up to cure myself of Catholic guilt that I let the church or myself impose on me as a child. And since I could never believe that I was God, then I had to experience it, but I got to do that via art, a very clever device. That was the coup that came out of year two, drop the accent, become God. Year one was about saying yes to passion and desire and sound. I became a night listener, turning on the note while I slept. And it's made me into a very good listener and a composer. 
I feel strongly about music and know it's the seven hours of the tone that is doing it to me. I asked my pendulum and it said that I could help others with music while helping myself by writing the book, which I have been able to keep going throughout the piece. Writing this book has actually become a substitute for sex. And I put incredible amounts of energy into it, especially a year ago when sex became security and I had opened the first chakra and couldn't handle the power. So now I write about sex and I've become a musician, turned from a visual focus to one that includes listening listening to my body, listening to the tone, listening to the accent, and the switch to sound and music as a primary focus and priority is an acceptable change. It almost feels as if I'm finally doing my parents because my mother sang in a band, my father played trumpet and drums. So in singing and playing the Casio, I am being both my parents. The chakra song that I've been playing for over 15 years has finally matured and now it has words and song. My voice is opening. The sound is Spanish for the year and I hope to become familiar with that lust and sweetness and sentiment. I speak or did speak in a Spanish accent. Now I think in a Spanish accent. I wanted to let off steam the way Latins do and to be friendly the way they are and to be loving and earthy in that way. So I hope that I have learned some of this this past year. Orange Room. I danced mightily to Celia Cruz records, made believe that I was Latin and guilt-free and in general, lost my breath at the beauty of the orange. It invited fun, pleasure, celebration, and I did that there in this chakra. Also because the second chakra is the site of the collective unconscious. For that reason, I was able to look at big hurts, nasty ideas, and large feelings. They came up at times, especially when I was with Dr. Mishra, my guru, they are a great force and I was at their mercy. My mind was my master and not my servant. I felt bad and guilty and instead should have been relieved that the bad things came up at all. I still haven't figured out techniques to handle negative thoughts, negative emotions, negative feelings, negative beliefs. Questions from year two. One, why did I spend so much time arbitrarily trying to find the right spot for the second chakra and not being able to settle on what I had first designed and allocated for that spot? Two, what happened to my energy? Three, is the energy of this chakra too much? And do I drain it off with trivia? Four, did I try hard enough to find a place to live? Five, am I secure? Six, do I understand money and security? Seven, am I doing enough spiritually, mentally, physically to make myself secure? Eight, was dropping the accent a mistake? Nine, am I producing lumps on my uterus by concentrating so much in that part of my body? Ten, Will I find the right place to live? 11. Home is where the heart is. 12. 
Is Teresa of Avila pleased with her incarnation in me? Seven years of living art, 1986 to 1987, year three, location two fingers below the navel, color yellow, chakra third, quality, courage, guts, will, personal power, accent jazz, guides, Alberta Hunter, visitors, Annie Sprinkle, Veronica Vera, Helene Elan, Miriam Abramovich. What happened? Physically, the physical change took place in Richard Schechter's class at NYU. While a fashion video played, room was lit only by a TV screen. I took off the orange clothes, put them to the left side of the TV screen, put on yellow ones. A week later, I invited over a few people to the yellow room at the Kingston Art Life Institute, had a jazz opening, which was cool, stripped down. People were feisty, cranky. I wondered what that meant as far as the year was concerned, because the opening generally gives a taste of what the year will be about. I knew that I would need guts and courage, the two gifts that come from that chakra, to get through this third year. The following is a recording taken from memory and journal entries of what happened that year. My guide, each year a guide inhabits, comes into and speaks through me. Yellow was Alberta Hunter, a Chicago blues singer who learned in the brothels, became internationally famous, retired for 40 years to be a nurse, and at a party which happened when she was in her 60s, she sang, was coaxed back out into public by those who heard her, and after that performed for 20 more years at the cookery. There was something about her joy, sauciness, presence, sexuality that impressed me when I saw her on TV. So I emulated that, intended that, wanting those qualities, got out of my own way so that she could do those things through me. On my way home from Schechner's class, and my change to yellow, a song by her, came on the radio, and it felt like an omen of rightness. She often spoke before a song and said, and now let's give thanks for all that we are about to receive. The erotic, sexual, religious overtones touched me, and I imitated her cool as much as I could that year. In fact, I attracted a few black friends from the neighborhood. Maybe they picked up on the vibe that I was trying to learn, even though I was gentrifying their neighborhood. Once I asked her to speak through me, and this is what she said. When I was a nurse, I served physically. When I was a singer, I served spiritually. It's all a sermon, all a teaching. It's all doctoring and nursing, every second of it. Be hip, baby, be hip. Physically, the body. Physically, I resemble Doris Day in drag, Dinah Shore after a chicken commercial, or Corey Kino giving a tour of Manila. Dressed in yellow, both I and all viewers are forced to smile, respond, see me, comment. I was clean cut looking, nobody wearing all yellow can be that bad. I was the sun, I was radiance, I was summer days, and that equaled having to get up the guts to be happy, since I look so happy. It forced a response in me because after being saturated with and in the color, it was not difficult to become as gold as I looked. 
Once, only once, did I have an urge to wear another color, and that was this year. I wanted to wear something black. Yellow surprised me because I could remember promising myself that I would never wear that color. And after a few days exposure, it became my favorite. I will go back to it when the piece is over, very eagerly. Journal. The fashion show aspect of the piece is fascinating. I shop at thrift stores all year, and when I can't keep any of other commitments, I always fall back on the clothes as a reminder that I'm doing the piece. But then I begin judging myself because I think that I'm being strict and cautious about that discipline because I'm in public view, and yet I can be sloppy about the other things because no one can see me if I break rules. I have let the accent and tone slip. Some days I have not been in the color space, but I have never violated the dress code. Home. The yellow room was spectacular and encouraged incredible dances, actions, ecstatic outbursts. Yellow was excessive, generous, effusive. And being in the yellow room for hours was an experience beyond words. But the mood was broken four months before I was to leave yellow. I was asked to leave 85 Abiel Street because they wanted to sell the building and having a painted room was a deterrent to the high price they were asking for the house. So I was faced with three problems. One, renovating the yellow room. Two, finding a new place. Three, improvising a temporary yellow space. I did this by hanging a yellow cloth over my bed or putting it over my head while I sat. Each aspect was different. The renovation was tedious and felt like a Sisyphusian ordeal. Actually, I got the room back to archival level. It was perfect, but all under the strict supervision of a very nervous landlord and landlady, a young artist couple who became sit-ins for authority. They were incredibly unskilled with instructions, criticism, etc. It was all very excruciating, sad, and rather then show my feelings. I worked for two weeks without stop, internalizing anger and grief, which I then externalized by having an accident because I used a sun lamp bowl by mistake to work by that on the floor so I could see better, and in doing so, burned my corneas. I had an emergency appointment with the eye doctor wore a patch and took a month to heal both of my eyes. While in that condition, I looked in the mirror and had a realization because what I saw was a newborn infant, red eyes, swollen, red face, crying. Was I recreating my birth? So that program was very strong and at the moment that I realized that I was rehearsing my birth. I changed the program in my brain and said to myself, my eyes were able to accept light without any bad effects and that they didn't ever have to be abused again. It felt like a breakthrough. Eyes have been a theme in my life and art. I've been blindfolded as an art event three or four different times for a week each time. I've injured my eyes four times and almost six times before this accident. I lived in the Sohazad bookstore, blindfolded for a week, training myself to get ready to be a senior citizen. Journal entry about being blindfolded for a week. I sat in the window recreating what I do, but here I do it publicly. I find that I am double seeing. Here I am on Canal Street in, in a window. 
I see what I am seeing and I also see what I am thinking. So no wonder I'm more tired and tense with sight. I do double work. While blindfolded, I only saw the image inside my brain, which was the memory of the person, place, or thing. I cooked by feel in the window. People watched outside. I thought that I was seeing because I was picturing it in my mind and didn't miss not having vision because the inner pictures, the other visions happened that year. Journal. I was sitting in the back of the meditation room in Monroe in sunglasses. Dr. Mishra, my meditation teacher, felt me there. Although the room was packed, he looked over, cried, and in the 16 years that I've known him, this is the first time that I've received such a powerful, positive recognition from my teacher. There were physiological changes. I felt as if I was getting younger. It's not because I dyed my hair yellow to match my clothes. Something happened organically that took away some pretty horrible conditioning that I can live without. I have flashes of being and looking four years old. What happened mentally? The physical effects, the mental became because yellow activated the third center, courage. I was setting myself up to change my mind about deep conditioning concerning joy, happiness. The thinking is quite convoluted, but goes something like this. Previously, joy was not allowed because suffering, guilt, and pain were the main themes of my life. Wearing yellow, being in the yellow space in the third center got me in touch with joy, but via sorrow and anger, I finally had the courage to get angry. This year, I really felt the darkness, the bad that I had avoided, and literally changed my mind. Journal. On my way to the Y, I was walking over the railroad tracks and experienced a honey-like golden ball that opened like a broken egg inside my brain. It poured through my sinuses, down my skull and spinal column. Ecstasy. Something about good and evil is happening this year. Courage has taken away the sting of evil. I was raised as a good Catholic girl saw that if I was bad, I would go to hell. This year, I got over the fear of hell, which kept me from knowing what it was really about. Sin, guilt, fear, the devil are words and concepts used to socialize children. Somehow, the East has offered me an alternative. Simply see things as they are out of balance. They don't say so-and-so is sick, but so-and-so is out of balance. That's kinder. Good Friday, I was delivering a car from High Falls. It was 1 p.m., the time that Jesus was dying on the cross. I saw in a vision or flash or whatever that I was trying to suffer as much or more than Jesus. Actually, I was in competition with him. So I gave him back the suffering, took it off my back, and stopped this vicious pattern of having to do even more than Jesus himself. And in doing that, I shivered, turned up the radio, sang my way back to Kingston. What happens spiritually? I see where the original split in me happened. I was acting like a good girl, had disassociated my sexual energy 
force myself to love, be nice, be sweet, by staying in the force and heat of the third chakra for a year, I had a chance to express and feel my guts and to express them. And in doing so, to respect all of it, the positive and the negative. Journal. It's the third year and I have a chance to give inordinate amounts of time to this piece. It's a gift that scares me because I'm trained to produce, to know where I'm going, to know what I'll be doing next year. I'm trained to make money, not waste time. But I now remember that this piece is a retraining. It's forcing me deeper inside. So now I am getting to understand how to move, when to move, how to cook, how to connect wherever I am. Maybe it's because everything is stripped away. No lover, no money, no job, no home, no future. Only a yellow rose from the garden looks at me and I stare back like an invalid without a hobby, like a sentence convict without parole, like a mother without a child, like a swimmer without water, like a lover without a partner. There's something to be learned about discipline. Many of the devotions that I observe are direct imitations of Catholic vows and penances. Only this time I, am, I impose them on myself. And if I break the rules, then I get to forgive myself. So I become the priest. I reappropriate the authority that I gave away to father, mother, church, to priest, to convent, and guru. I've taken the burden off of them. Now I reclaim my souls that when I sin, don't listen to the sound, etc. I get to say, just notice it, Linda. You didn't do it today, and guess what? You're not a bad girl. Noticing that I'm not doing it is as valuable as doing it. I want the work to produce the same clarity, alertness, skill, integrity that my surgeon brother must have when he operates. This risk that I take is asking art and this experiment to perform the same function as tried and tested spiritual traditions that offer enlightenment to the devotee who follows the path of the establishment. It's about learning to observe and not about learning to keep strict rules. Rules come from outside. Even if I make them up and impose them, it's still an imposition. I'm going toward a position of letting rules come from the inside. Then the impetus is love, naturalness, not duty. What happened aesthetically? It's still amazing how I can remain in the art world and do whatever I want whenever I want and call that art. It demands an incredible responsibility. And I think that I should be working harder. Conversely, it gets easier and easier. The intention is simple to open the chakra, wait for the response. That is, the world tells me what it wants because I've let it know that I'm vibrating at that frequency. All I do is take orders from nature document the color changes, keep a journal of thought and dreams, and have a two-week residency each year. And I go to the new museum once a month, third year on the third day of that year. In general, I sit back and see what I've magnetized to myself via the wavelength I'm on. So out of an incredible structure comes freedom and non-doing. Isn't that Eastern? Journal. The San Francisco Art Institute gave me a large show. 
designed two floors, the bottom one completely yellow. Richard built a 12 foot high monolithic room, three sided. I read palms inside. Upstairs were documents of performances from 1964. It was an astonishing spectacle with a lot of thought, time, effort, money being spent to make it happen. This is very wonderful and I feel like a successful person in the traditional sense. I go once a month to the new museum to read palms, do tarot and counseling. People come in with art problems. For example, they say, taking slides around is so humiliating and money problems. They say, how can I be a good artist and pay my rent at the same time? And life problems, they say, I haven't had a relationship in a year, why? Often I look at their hand first, see what I see, then have them cut the deck seven times before picking a tarot card. A man came in, his partner had died of AIDS six months before. He told me that I had read cards for them. When I first saw the cards, I had a funny look on my face. He had remembered the card and I indicated I had no reason to make that face, that it was a good card, nothing to worry about. I saw then how powerful my position is and felt shaken by the enormity of my position and by that situation. When it comes down to it, I've set it up so that I have to be alert, responsible frame of mind because other people's welfare depends on it. I've given myself a job that demands responsibility, good planning. I've taken an ordinary job cleaning houses for dustbusters. It keeps me physically active, sociologically astute, and is a constant reminder that all of my work is simply a cleaning out of conditioning, like being a dustbuster inside myself in preparation from some experience for some experience to come. It's interesting to watch how cleaners are treated. Some clients are embarrassed. Some clean up before we get there. Some are superior, some not changed. Only once was I driven to step out of the role when a commercial artist was getting too uppity, treating me like an untouchable, I said to him, I'm an artist too. There is still a great relief knowing that my life is structured for another four years and also looking and knowing that I'm in the state of art 24 hours during all that time. That protects me from having to produce art or to go to the studio. I am art. Using the accent all the time, if I don't use it, I think of it or remember that I didn't use it, is another reminder that all conservations and all conversations are also material for mindfulness. Seven years of living art is merely a temporary map, tool, and training device that allows me, one, the illusion that I control my life, two, I go to the new museum once a month and see interesting people, three, the pleasure of breaking my own rules so that I can forgive myself, become my own authority, four, the opportunity to see if the recipe works. When drawing, and it's very important to feel, sense, observe, and then duplicate the outside form exactly or as symbol. Every year I do only one drawing which is a document of how I felt that year, what I sensed that year. 
I love to draw, but I did not allow myself to draw anything else that whole year. That same rigor in applying to myself, in observing who I am, training by vowing to wear colors, listen to sounds, instead of seeing a flower out there and duplicating it, I am asking my mind to pay attention, clear itself via my rules so that I can either rebel, find my own natural position because my rules are found to be unreasonable, or else keep the rules to clarify things. I am getting spiritual muscles. I am drawing one drawing a year. I am training myself. I am making vows which I keep and sometimes don't keep. I am forgiving myself. <clears throat> I had four visitors this year, two sets of friends, each couple more dynamic than the other. Annie Sprinkle, Veronica Vera, Helene Elan, Miriam Abramovich, all four of them wonderful. It's like a marriage each time. We work together minute by minute. The intimacy is most excruciating in intensity. Could I live like that forever? I call it summer saint camp. They keep convent rules. No hot water. Very little food. No movies perform every night, meditate, exercise. It's aesthetic endurance training. We become spiritual lovers for a week. What happened emotionally? For the first time in 30 years, I've cleaned up some old emotional garbage guilt, shame that had plagued and ruined me. The Courage Center provided the guts I need to dig deep into the darkness, unearth the junk and confront the monsters. I strongly believe that I couldn't have done it without the intentionality and focus of the Courage Chakra. Once it was completed, I became youthful, virginal again, able to use anger, I became hormonally balanced, self-preserving, all those good things. Journal. He is my universe. I can't have him. So on August 17th, I married the universe. That way I get him and everything else. So it was richer giving him up than it was holding on. Art is truly magical, alchemical. Here I was for two and a half years, obsessing over him, wanting him, and all of that time and energy was leaking out of me. It went with a desire. One night the heat became insatiable and I wrote love story. And voila, Eureka, the passion got directed into a form. He, the obsession, turned into the muse. Coal got alchemized into diamonds. And not only that, I've sent off 15 of the stories to a publisher. So eventually my tears will turn into money. Conclusion of the third year, courage, courage to feel, courage to be, courage to feel angry, courage to be blind, courage to feel guilt, courage to be intimate, courage to feel sexual, courage to be alone, Courage to feel power. Courage to be a house cleaner. Courage to feel negative. Courage to be positive. 
courage to feel embarrassed, courage to be Alberta Hunter, courage to feel frightened, courage to be brave, courage to feel, courage to be alive, courage to be alive, courage to be alive. Nineteen eighty seven to nineteen eighty eight, year four, the heart chakra. The apprehension of going from yellow to green was appropriate and fitting because subconsciously I intuited that it would be an awesome year. As a result, I didn't plan a huge opening or celebration, but changed clothes and chakras on December eight, nineteen eighty seven, at my father's seventy fifth birthday party in Sargadis, New York. It was as simple as sitting in the kitchen with them in yellow clothes and then going out on the porch, changing to green, coming back inside. My father's comment was, Linda, you look like a vegetable. I don't think that anything more was said by anyone about my clothes. In November of 1987, I prepared for the lessons of the heart by losing my home, which was about to be sold. And home is where the heart is became an axiom that I was to test for the entire year since a semi-homelessness followed me until even now, a year and a half later, the same feeling persists. As a result of the displacement, all of my rules, regulations, disciplines, and commitments shifted, and I was unable to rigidly and succinctly maintain adherence to spending time in a colored space three hours a day, to listening to a sound seven hours a day. So I improvised. I let go of the initial plans and saw the loosening up as a way of forgiving myself for things I didn't really need to do, but said I would do. Aren't artists given permission to make or break their own rules whenever they want? By letting go of the external forms that I said that I would keep, I was actually preparing myself for some inner lessons that demanded all of my strengths, attention, and endurance. Remember, it was the heart chakra. Everything shifted in 1988, and because I intended to open the heart, I asked life to send me everything, everything I needed to experience in order to do just that, to open my heart. I stripped down the piece to those basic elements of intentionality to open the heart, and I reminded myself of the intention by wearing all green clothes, going to the new museum once a month, and channeling a mentor. Meridel Lesur, an 85-year-old poetess, was my mentor for that year. Since the chambers of my heart were crammed and stuffed with repressions, fears, and wounds, it took incredible dynamited explosions of tragedy to dislodge the barriers to feeling. It started with my brother-in-law's death. I watched him transform from a six foot five football type giant to a stranger from outer space, a being who began acting mythologically after two brain operations, chemo and much medication. That's a whole story in itself. But when I was in New York City for a day while teaching in Ohio, I knew that I had to go upstate to see him from New York. I walked into his room at his house and saw him purple gasping with hands that were already dead and cold. I said goodbye, sat on the other twin bed, consciously keeping my heart open, watching him die in increments and inches from his feet from his ankles, inches from feet, from his ankles, his lower legs, his fingers, his hands, his lower arms were dying. I was then two hours and 45 minutes later. 
he died. Journal. I stood next to Carl's dying body and kept my heart open. It was excruciating. Breathing kept me alive. I was determined to take it, not flinch, not ignore anything as I watched him turn purple. As I watched him shut off and shut down and go away, I didn't leave. The heart chakra. Open. Teaching performance at Ohio State University kept me busy, focused, and swimming every day. So instead of spending inordinate amounts of time worrying about Carl or my mother or my own new cancer prognoses, I was able to apply my energies to a full schedule of teaching and performing. Energy was high and I did a chakra piece, which included 38 performers. Over 500 people attended. In Ohio, my heart was in my work, and in order to return to Kingston and my mother's illness, I took five sessions of rebirthing as preparation. Journal. Watching my mother die these last four years, and more specifically these five weeks, has been excruciating. She was racked with pain, tortures, bloodlettings, medieval strategies, until it became so unbearable that I threatened suicide if they did one more thing to her. I was there nights in the hospital watching, falling apart, crying at the side of her bed, observing jugular vein implants being botched, vein failures, and turkey basters filled with clots taken from her bladder. It was beyond description. Life has become my teacher. I am being opened by default. Everything hurts so much that I can't stay closed down. There is no equivalency for the screams that come from my heart. Her death also healed me because I was racked so wide open that I could finally bond with her. Wrenched, wrenched. Morphine took away her armoring, sorrow took away mine. She paid me the highest tribute and honor that I've ever experienced from her when she looked into my eyes and said, and truly meant it, thanks, champ. It's what I had always waited for and wanted from her, and I made art for her and acted out for her and wanted for her and felt despondent because I never got it, and she did it. My mother and I bonded on her deathbed. Thanks, champ. Thanks, mom. But I've almost forgotten. Chamber three of the heart also needed cleaning, and Betty, my companion of 16 years, the performance dog, had to be put to sleep just before my mother died, 16 years old. She was the absorber of all of my life issues, had performed in almost all of my pieces, had been recognized by high Tibetan lamas, as, as an incarnate high being, and gurus and meditators loved her. She was Benji-like and extremely lovable, definitely a higher being. At the end, deaf and blind, 16, not walking, the vet concurred that euthanasia was appropriate. That choice stretched the muscles in my chest, exploded my heart, detonated it with sorrow. And then my heart could take no more, no more testing for AIDS, no more death, no more homelessness, no more pap smears, no more mammograms, no more one-way love affairs, and it all magically stopped and turned gentle and easy and nourishing. Friends appeared, reappeared, talking, supporting, feeding me, dressing the wounds. I was given an initiation by my meditation teacher and that same month I was told, quote, you're getting better at karate by the sensei. Had I passed some tests that made my heart my home? It's possible because in August I bought a house which was really an abandoned building next to Pauline's and began fixing it while fixing myself with hospice training which gave me a certificate and authorization to emotionally support the terminally ill. I would like to talk also about the fourth year of the heart with a story. 
Throughout the piece, I've been receiving phone calls from Beth Ames Schwartz, an artist who has painted and painted the chakras. Once in the middle of all of this, she called and said, the abyss is right at this point, Linda, because after opening the heart, everything else is home because the hard work has been done. Journal. Since I was still living at Mary Ann Amiche's, I couldn't have a colored room. So I put a green tent over my bed and kept the disciplines minimally. By then the tone, colored room, accent had disappeared from the contract. Too hard to maintain. And the truth was that life was offering enough occasions for maturing so that the disciplines that I had written into the piece seemed paltry, unnecessary. Journal. For the next three months, April through June, I was with my mother, who was now terminal. She had bone and colon cancer. I became her nurse, hospice volunteer, colostomy bag cleaner, and between my father and I, we were her support. Another journal entry. Watching my mother die over the past four years, and more specifically these five weeks, has been excruciating. She was racked with pain, tortures, bloodlettings, vein collapses, medieval bondages to a degree that was unthinkable. I was there watching falling apart, crying, observing ugly things beyond description. Now life itself was my teacher. I and my heart are opened by default. I watched, I waited while mom did everything for the last time. My heart screamed as she reached up and touched me, laughed on high morphine dosages. As she observed the hairs on my face, my heart expanded as she rebonded with me with two simple words, thanks champ, thanks champ. And as she died, she sang and it sounded like this. My dying mother, my singing mother, sang herself to death. Communication Chakra 5 1988 to 1989, throat, thyroid, blue, Catherine Hepburn is my guide. The desire to get out of the heart was palpable, and the promise of an easier year was assured on intuition alone, or more simply put, I refuse to have another year like that green one. The fact that I'm a snake in Chinese astrology made it seem even more weighted towards success. Even though I knew that my throat was loaded with information, messages, unspoken secrets and shame, screams, unscreamed screams, words unsaid, truth suppressed. That is, as a young child, I chose the inner path of good girl, never causing any waves, never speaking up and my throat took the brunt of it all. Listed are some of the manifestations and memories from that time. <clears throat> when I was seven years old, I choked down cold eggs every a.m. and then vomited them down the parents' new wallpaper because I was afraid to tell my parents 
that the kids were stepping on my coat when it fell down in the cloakroom. But actually, it was really about Sister Stephen and what she was doing in the classroom. When I was 10 years old, I was lassoed off a horse around my neck by my brother's friend. My entire childhood until 17, I was choked by someone <clears throat> and I screamed uncontrollably. When I was 12 years old, the trunk of the car fell down on my hand, but my coat collar and neck kept the trunk from cutting my hand off. At 21, I became anorexic. I starved myself until I weighed 80 pounds, going from 135 to 80 pounds near death. In my 40s, my tonsils filled up with debris, which I clean out and now see as snake venom. I had a throat tick, which was comprised of a gesture that jutted my chin out, stretched my throat up, and made me look like somebody who was really trying to get air. At that time, I was able to breathe, not able to breathe, then complain to my mother, not able to get my breath over the hill, into my throat. Given these psychophysiological histories, here is how the year of the throat progressed. I changed December 8 at my meditation teacher's. As he walked into the house where meditation was to be held, I waited and told him, Guruji, I changed today to the throat. I had my sweater pulled down, exposing my neck, and he reached out with an ET-like finger and touched my Adam's apple, conferring a blessing on my throat. That's exactly what I needed and wanted, so I went upstairs, changed from green to blue, came down, meditated, and left, but with a great restlessness. Often, when I'm there at the ashram, the influx of new, clear, unconditional energy and love drives me away, as it did that morning. The assignment for the year was again that of intending to communicate the truth, but first to myself and when appropriate to others and my family was on my list. I talked with my sister that year and sent a letter to my older brother and things have improved in these relationships. Somehow becoming more creative since creativity, visualization, will, are found in that chakra, but they were not priorities. Communi communication was my goal. That year, I vowed to communicate. I asked to be open to receive truth and give truth to communicate. And having come from a Zen-like nonverbal family, that did most of its work through gesture, music, and unspoken intentions. This was going to be an experience of adding deeper levels of expression so that the wounded child would have an easier time. As I write this year-end report, I'm beginning to gain a perspective on my project and see it all as a giant experiment in reprogramming and reparenting. I'm going and giving to myself time and structure and a chance and an invitation to fill in the blanks or iron out the wrinkles of my past. So how did events conspire and arise to shape the year and the intention? I gave myself an excuse to communicate and that was owning a home the home was an incredibly large undertaking. The house represented such abandonment, loss, despair, disrepair, abuse, that it absorbed all of my time and energy and make me both talk and mourn my mother, among other things. Because I told my mother I don't know how to cry, but I know how to sweat. 
So I bought this 15 year abandoned bakery and put all of my sweat and tears in tears of sweat into the building. Most of my mother's energy went into redecorating and designing our home. So I felt her approve of my techniques of being in this house after her death. When I checked it out with her, she was sure that it was okay to do something concrete with the despairing confusion that I felt when she died. Plus, I had to communicate all the time and use my throat because Jerry the plumber was there for months, Harry the electrician for months, Louis the carpenter for years, the roofer, Tayshin came and helped me, my nieces helped me, and every minute of every day for that year and for the next year, except when I was teaching in Ohio, I was being the contractor, the builder, it meant hours at City Hall getting variances, clearances, the legal things cleared, hours on the phone with lumber yards, electricians, plumbing, plumbing supply houses. I was being forced to say what I needed and wanted because it was about my house and thousands of dollars were being spent on it. The incentive was high. The other area which forced communication and talking was my class at Ohio State University. The year before, I had been in the heart chakra. The classes there were like love fests. Everyone was ooing, eyeing, getting married from the energy and openness. It was a honeymoon. That's because it was the heart year. So when I returned to Ohio, the new students had been primed for a repeat of the past, but the chemistry was all wrong. It was different. It made it difficult to repeat the past, to repeat the heart chakra, that old bugaboo expectations again. It could have happened, but there was a particularly strong-minded verbally abusive, inquisitive, yet totally talented woman in the class who was intent on gadflying and stopping anything that looked like a consensus, that looked like a tribe might be forming. She spoke louder than, faster than, more angrily than, more authoritatively than anybody, especially me and sent me to many a sleepless nights into taking an assertiveness training class. Basically, I just didn't know how to deal with her and was too protective of my role as teacher to work with her in the classroom. It was great performance material, but it was real life. Oh yes, there is more. One of the ways that I teach is everyone lies on the floor and she never changed her clothes, in fact, smelled very bad. So I couldn't do the things that I usually do in my classes. I began asking my, myself, how else can I open the throat and communicate? And when the idea to go to the Newman Center and talk out how I felt betrayed by the church came into my mind, I did it. And when I felt that it was a perfect time for singing lessons, I took them. And when I thought that I should have a doctor look at my throat, I went. Some unfinished business regarding my mother's death got done in the blue year. And by the way, I liked how I looked in blue, very much like the Virgin Mary, I said to myself, and yet, I was having some of the most passionate, wild, satisfying sex I had ever had, experimented with things that were featured in other magazines. I had taken hospice training, was given a client who was dying, whose name I won't use. She was totally articulate, verbal, funny, demanded communication, demanded stories, 
She demanded that I talk with her, confront her, be with her on that level, that I use my throat chakra. The three months that I spent with her were totally satisfying, and I knew that it was one of the most instructive and beneficial life performances that I have participated in. And another success, talking to my arthritis and watching it disappear and going to court after getting a ticket for weaving on the yellow line after I had an accident on the throughway because I was nervous. The car was picked up by the wind and thrown against the guardrail in Newburgh and talking my way out of that ticket with impending points and insurance rates going up and other penalties and talking with business people about my finances, strategies, and equities, seeing adjustments being made. And another success, at the ashram, I start blossoming creatively. My teacher has me read a lot spiritual treatises during his meditation program. And my voice comes from the earth, and I find I can call in the author from India, become usually this author, and channel the information as him, even though I'm reading a treatise, a trick I call getting out of my own way. And I'm king of the monkeys in the Ramayana, and a mentally retarded woman, Dottie, in Frank Moore's work, and Stephen Snow and I, perform the seven chakras at the ashram. And yes, there is more, an easier time with my father and as a result with all men, and an ability to ask for what I need and find it, but also a release of such incredible energy that I can hardly stay on the road out of danger or away from death, which felt close to me this year. So I devise the image of a grounding cord. And as I end this report, I will only hint at what I already began initiating. The next chakra kicks in one month before it begins. A change which, yes, did happen and confirmed all the signs that the balance was too high and off track, although it didn't manifest in the throat year. So you'll have to read about it in chapter six, chakra six. I end with great respect, gratitude, and awe for this process that I have created. And I've invited my life and notes from a dream given to me in the blue year. This is the dream. I'm standing in front of Guruji, my meditation teacher and a big wad of phlegm comes out of my nose and mouth. I am healed and I scream in the dream. The Sixth Year, Purple, 1988-1989. As the piece progresses, I notice that there are fewer notes and diary entries. It gets simpler, I get simpler. Words are insufficient. For this year, Mother Teresa is the guide. The note is E, color purple. Summer Saint Camp participants are Tony Lieberman, Faith Pittman, Annie Sprinkle, and Barbara Corrales. I change at the Pathwork Center, Phoenicia, New York, during a women's mystery retreat. I own Undresses and Dresses Me while Pauline plays accordion. I become a surrendered devotee, not needing control, a baby being changed, an orphan in need of a mother, a paralytic. I let I own help me, change me, expose and clothe me while Pauline plays and drones long tones. I am desperate to re-see the mother and use this performance to do so. Purple, the sixth year. 
In Hindu mythology, two snakes meet eye to eye at the third eye, the pineal gland, representing male and female energy. It's the place where nadam or inner sound is heard. The site chosen by my teacher, Brahmananda Saraswati, as the place to meditate on, focus on, concentrate on, and from that stillness comes an absorption and absorption that goes beyond body and mind. Events, one, severe headaches, as if some vein or artery or nerve is damaged. It travels from in back of my eye to the top of my head on the left side. I am alarmed, go to an internist who counsels me on my personal life, says I'm in need of right living. I want to get a CAT scan, have my head examined, but don't press for it. Two, I see the way that I've been living for five years has been completely demoralizing to those around me. That's what I'm thinking, because this chakra is my brain. The cover is blown, the lid is off. I get to feel like the bad girl again. Guilt surfaces so strongly, I spend three months almost entirely in bed. Remember, I am in the sixth chakra in my brain. I get up to teach at UCLA and I go to meditation. My association with Zen teacher Mayazumi Roshi and with Karuna at the Internet International Buddhist Center keeps me on the planet. The worst depression since Mitchell's death. I see that the body is impermanent and changes. Menopause, physical changes, wrinkles, cellulite, fibroids are alarming. Death is seen for the first time by me, and I begin playing with the image to get acquainted with it. I see that I need a communal life for a while, that living alone is detrimental. So I invest money for two years at the ashram so that I can come and go. It is one of the most mature statements I've ever made. So from November 9, 1990 to December 1992, I can live full or part-time at Ananda Ashram, my meditation center, in a wood-paneled 8 by 12 foot trailer in the woods. It's fabulous. It has only electric and satisfies my need to be isolated, primitive, yet spiritually communal. I use my home as an office, retreat center, and workplace. It is the happiest time of my life. I see that I can receive and need nurturing and reparent with, with an Indian couple, two Ayurvedic doctors living at the ashram. During the summer, we become bonded, inseparable, and I spend money again to visit them in Texas the first time I've ever invested in a trip for life and pleasure, no business intended. I see that I need to circulate energy, that I am off balance. This is about my head, my brain, my intuition chakra. Recently, I performed in the Northwest for a day, read palms, and did art life counseling in a small dressing room far from the right from the front desk at a performance space. Everything was going well. People came with one question prepared about food, sex, money, fame, or death. After about 12 people, a tattered, young, mouth-quivering guy came in. I immediately smelled trouble. He seemed intent and dirty, reached into a bag, brought out a tape recorder, asking, then demanding that he use it. I didn't resist because, because at this point, I realized that not resisting was winning. Aikido. From the same bag, he brought a piece of paper with a prepared question, which was more about me than him. I said, quote, the game is played the other way. You ask a question for yourself, end quote. He bumbled something, again, no contest. I played his way, pulled a card, it was the Empress, and I smelled intuited trouble, this time knowing that it was mother trouble, but didn't see that or tell him that, and offered something like, quote, a loving, caring woman, end quote. He agreed. That was a good answer. 
Then out of the same bag, this scraggled, tortured twerp pulled out a hammer, stood over me, one hand on the desk, the other in the air, clenching the hammer, which by then was shaking with fury, close to my seventh chakra, top of my head, and said, quote, and how would you answer me if I asked, what would you do if I hit you over the head and killed you, end quote. The shock and words still catch my breath as I write this. What I did was to run inside myself where a large reservoir of fear or energy or adrenaline lay waiting, chakra one. And then I felt this move, this energy, snake-like to my guts, chakra three. That triggered a response in my left arm, which either raised instinctively or imaginatively, which then touched off the fifth chakra, throat, which communicated this response, quote, I would ask that person to leave the room immediately. His response was, quote, that answer is okay. I won't kill you this time, end quote. Then he packed his bag and left. I maintained eye contact the whole time, the sixth chakra. This brings an end to journal entries for the sixth chakra, intuition, third eye, pineal gland. Report white December 8 to December 8, seventh chakra. I change from purple to white at Ananda Ashram. Guru Brahmananda Saraswati goes to the bathroom and when he comes back, throws three white flowers at me. It is an in intuition and an initiation into the thousand petal lotus, the top chakra, Sahasrara. That night I sleep in the trailer and the moon comes in the window, shines on the top of my head. My guide this year is Aruna Mehta, an Ayurvedic midwife who delivered 2,000 babies in India. Note is F, my accent is natural. Journal entry on December Two, I attended a sweat lodge at Ananda Ashram where I've been in residence since June 1990. Laura Wolf, Morning Star, leads the sweats, but this time was accompanied by two swarthy sensitive types who seemed to be part of the group. That day I was not available for any nonsense, so when she introduced them and said they danced each year in South Dakota, where they were pierced with hooks, etc., and that was the real thing. I detected a kind of elitism, felt like leaving, but didn't. The guys talked macho about hooks through chest muscles and about being roped to trees, about pulling buffalo skulls from hooks stuck in their flesh on their back. Male activities, male activities. If the skulls didn't break the flesh, Kids would sit on the skulls to add weight. Women could dance and give, quote, flesh offerings, quote. That's all. Flesh was cut from the arm, placed in a prayer tie, and offered. Morning Star then invited anyone who wanted to offer flesh there and then. The thought sent a wave of electricity through the group of assembled neo-Buddhist Hindu ex-Catholic Presbyterians who became inst instantly reflective. We were going to become real Indians real fast. Something snapped in me, an alarm. I moved, twitched, pecked, my eyes crossed, nostrils flare. As fight, flight, adrenaline set in, should I do it, shouldn't I? Then things got gruesome. The guy with dirty hands began to cut awkwardly and primitively into the arm of the cleaner California guy from Sonoma. He lifted flesh with a pin, then sliced it like bologna with a razor. 
simple sacred surgery, but it wasn't working. So Morningstar took over and did a grisly job, blood all over down the clean arm and after four cuts down her arm, oops, AIDS, I want it out. Remember, it's the time of AIDS. But then I pushed into the line waiting to be cut. I picked up a clean razor and watched each woman clutch the chinupa or sacred pipe, pray, offer flesh. The clean guy was doing a good job, concise, efficient, surgically correct. So I joined, a voice inside me said, quote, give it all, give your flesh, give your pattern, give your genetic coding, give the computer program that you carry from generations back cut it out now, end quote. So I got a clean needle from the dirty guy, otherwise they use the same needles on everyone, AIDS, even though they sterilized it in the fire each time. I handed my personal tools to the cool California guy, clutched the pipe, faced the altar, and let him cut away a very perverse pattern from my past that isn't appropriate and kind to anyone anymore. As he cut, he said, quote, this flesh is pretty stubborn, it won't cut. I said, so was the pattern, but now it's gone. Much to my regret, I held back the vomit that came up and forced it back down so I could stand around the fire with the others who had also offered their flesh. Someday soon, I'll vomit. This year is about death also, so was the heart year. In Tibetan, the soul leaves from the top of the head. Death anxiety is the last taboo. I want to crack it. Top chakra, bliss, the bliss of worry, the bliss of bliss, year to blow my mind. That pain in my head, have to go for a CAT scan. Short-term memory gone. Why am I stuttering? What's that about? We'll have medical checkup, but I think it's a combination of menopause and psychology, hormones. Betty, my dog, I re-see on the road via a woman with a dog just like Betty. She visits me in another form. I kneel down, talk to the dog. Dog looks at me funny. Betty's death is beyond death. When will I feel it? It has propelled me to silence. I feel guilty because I can't cry. I'm in silent tears. Margaret, the editor typesetter for this writing, now has my car, which I named Betty. My father bought me a Tercel. This is the year to open the mind. This is the year to create space in my mind. Do it now. Don't wait for an accident. Why is my head crawling like lice or ants burrowing in my hair? White clothes all the time, a lot of Clorox. I feel very careful this year, can't get dirty because then I have to do more laundry. I'm a spot remover expert. Had my eyes examined. Doctor says ocular migraines, head still hurts. My drawing this year, because I draw one drawing every year, limiting my love of drawing to one drawing as a document of the year. This year, it's of a half male, half female, three-headed being. The main head is angry. I want anger to blow out of the blowhole on the top of my head. I start therapy again and talk about the inner child. God, I hate that term. The inner child now can feel and express anger. Boundaries. Neurogenous death. I blow my mind by taking a job. Everyone else losing theirs. Everyone at the University of Texas Austin Art Department teaching performance. Naranjana dies. She's at the hospital near the ashram in Monroe, New York. 
I go in, she's thrashing about, very, very large, lying on bed. Her eyes are bugging out. I tell her, just use the teaching of our teachers. You're not this body, you're not this mind. She calms down. I leave the room to make phone calls to the ashram to tell them the end is near for Naranjana. When I come back, she's dead. The nurse comes in and closes her eyes and said she was a very, very nice artist. The doctor proclaims that she is dead. After she dies, they said, gather her things. I open the top drawer, the table next to her. It's filled with candy. The Ranjana always makes everyone happy. Tony dies. He's 85 years old. I met him at his junkyard seven years ago. I loved him. He helped me build my house, sometimes even brushed my hair. I helped him dance. He was dead two days on his bedroom floor. Always the teacher. He always said to me, it's all junk. Now our spirits have less baggage. He still visits in my dreams. The new museum gives me a great send-off. The staff perform the seven chakras. Moira Roth flies in from California. Marsha Tucker is the MC. She is in drag. I change in New York City out of white. Sing, scream, shout the seven chakras with Pauline Oliveris' Deep Listening Band. She gives me a beautiful chance to be a rock star. I sing, I scream, I shout in her band. For the next seven years, I have donated myself as a living sculpture to the United Nations as an artist for peace. And this is called Another Seven Years of Living Art. I have vowed not to make any creative interviews, writings, or be public. I've done it all. Now I want to just live.